Hi, this is Irv Shapiro with Make With Tech, where we learn about technology together. Today, I'm going to explain a little bit about how self-driving vehicles work. Self-driving vehicles. When I was growing up, we had cars and trucks and buses. We, we didn't have vehicles. I guess that's probably because people weren't driving crossovers and SUVs and all these different variations that maybe are trucks and maybe are cars, but that's an aside. Now let's get to the point. Today I'm going to help you understand how self-driving cars work so you can understand if they're good, if they're bad, and when they'll really be practical. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Self-driving cars use a variety of different types of sensors in order to detect the environment around them. That's what we do when we drive as human beings. When we're driving down the street, we look out the front window, we look in our rear view mirror, we listen for horns and other sounds, we actually even feel the road and that gives us a sense of how the vehicle is driving. We have a variety of senses that we use. Most self-driving cars work in the exact same way with a variety of sensors. They are programmed to use input from these sensors and detect obstacles, detect conditions, and then proceed safely. Now, let's think about this a bit together so we can have a better sense of whether we trust a computer to do this for us. To completely understand self-driving cars, we need to understand the levels of automation that the industry defines. Level zero is what traditional cars do, maybe with a couple of extra sensors. As an example, that light in your side view mirror, when there's somebody in your blind spot, that's level zero. Level one is basically traditional cruise control, but also augmented cruise control, adaptive cruise control. If you've never used adaptive cruise control, it's really a life changer if you're in stop and go traffic, you're driving downtown, you're sitting in the car for a half hour, an hour, in my city, sometimes an hour and a half. Adaptive cruise control that senses with radar the car in front of you and then slows down and speeds up your car appropriately really is a life changer. And that level of automation is pretty much common across a wide range of cars. It used to only be in the top most, most expensive vehicles. Now entry-level cars have adaptive cruise control and indicators in their side view mirrors. Level two is starting to take a page from what sounds like science fiction. In level two, the car can automatically adjust the speed and it can automatically steer within its lane. And in fact, in some level two implementations, if you tap the turn signal, it will automatically switch lanes for you. So it doesn't know where it's going. It's basically following the lanes on the road. And if it doesn't have a good indication of the lanes, it can't see the lines, so to speak, or the radar isn't working to judge distances to the car in front of you, it will alert the driver to manually take over. In fact, in level two, there must always be a driver. Now, in Ford Blue Cruise, which is an example level two, there's actually a camera right above your steering column that watches you. And if you stop watching the road, it will notify you that it's going to start slowing the car down and drop out of automated driving. It will continue to steer so it's safe, 
but ensures that you must be an active participant. So think of level two as adaptive cruise control with some level of steering. Level three is really what Tesla has been talking about as full self-driving. Within a controlled environment, the car will drive on its own. Now, it doesn't know where you're going. It's not, you don't put into your GPS your destination and say, go there. But basically, when you're driving, the car will automatically stop for traffic lights, for vehicles in front of it, for pedestrians. You can tap on the turn signal. It'll automatically turn. However, you still, once again, must be an active participant. You're basically the safety manager. Now, level four takes it beyond that. In level four, theoretically, no driver is required. But level four has really only been implemented so far in some automated taxi tests within a constrained geography, a very relatively small area where the speed limits generally are lower and it's geofenced. So if the car starts to go beyond the boundaries of the area that's been mapped out, it will switch back to manual mode. I think you'll see, it looks like you'll see level four automation primarily in taxis initially. Level five, is what we probably think of when we think of fully automated cars. You go into the app on your phone or the app in the car, you put in an address and the car takes you there. If your car's in a parking lot and you go into the app and put in your current address, the car will come to you. Now, how do self-driving cars work? Well, just as I described earlier, we sense the environment around us. Self-driving cars do it the same way. But they use technologies called radar, which is radio waves that are sent out from the car. And when they bounce back, the car uses the amount of time it took for them to bounce back to judge the distance. They use sonar, which are sound waves doing the same thing. They use LIDAR, which are laser beams, light doing the same thing, and they use cameras. Now, one of the interesting controversies in the industry is that Tesla has chosen to only use cameras. And they've begun to ship cars that don't have radar or sonar or LIDAR. In fact, Tesla, I believe, has never used LIDAR. The challenge there is with a camera, it's a little harder to judge distance. You need at least two cameras to have stereoscopic vision to judge distance at all. And their competitors believe that it's putting the automated cars at a disadvantage. Now, when we think about it as human beings, we don't just use vision. We're also using sound. We're using, as I mentioned, feel. We're using our other senses integrated together. So I'm not a big fan of the Tesla approach. The National Safety Council has predicted that with a complete suite of advanced driver assistance capabilities, now this is not even full automated driving. This is driver assistance capabilities. So adaptive cruise control, the lights in your mirror, backup protection, front collision, auto braking. With these types of things, there'll be a drop of over 60% in traffic accidents. And that's going to save tens of thousands of lives. That's really important. So why is it that these automated features are better than we are, than human beings. Well, the typical sensor used in an automated system responds along with the computer in about 150 milliseconds. That's 150 
thousandth of a second. The typical human being, you and I, now I'm already a bit older. I'm probably even slower as we age, it gets slower. But let's say a healthy 30 year old responds in about 1.5 seconds. That means the computer has the potential to respond in a tenth of the time, 10 times faster. That's why the collision avoidance, the side mirror capabilities, the adaptive speed control are in many ways safer. And when we get to fully automated driving, then as more and more vehicles are on the road, they'll be all responding to events 10 times faster than we could as human beings. Now, how fast is this really going to evolve? Well, we can look at Tesla for a good example. Tesla began offering automated driving in 2014, and Elon Musk predicted that by 2020, we'd have full self-driving. Now, it's not clear whether he meant level three, level four, or level five, but he predicted by 2020, we'd have full self-driving. We're not there yet. And it's three years later. In addition, there's another challenge, and that challenge is the legal system. Once we get to full self-driving, if there's an accident between two cars, whose fault is it? Who gets sued? The auto manufacturer or the driver, or the passenger really, sitting in the back seat? Even before we get to level five and level four, where the car's doing most of the driving, you're still sitting in the driver's seat. If there's an accident, whose fault is it? So unfortunately, our legal systems often evolve more slowly than our technology systems. So we may have in, I don't know, five or 10 years, full self-driving technology but will society be ready for it? Well, this is a fascinating topic. I love the adaptive cruise control. And in fact, the lane following the automatic steering in my Ford Mach-E using Blue Cruise. But it still needs a bit of fine tuning. At times, to be honest, it scares me. So with that as background, I hope you know a little bit more about automated driving and what we can look for in the future. Thanks so much for watching. You can go to forum.makewithtech.com to learn more about this topic and talk to other people. You can go to our website at makewithtech.com and let's continue to learn things together.